Okay, anyone here familiar with the story about how certain critics from Rotten Tomatoes got bombarded with hate comments because they gave The Dark Knight Rises bad reviews? And that some commenters went so far they actually started giving these critics death threats? Now I know that sounds a little harsh, and I do not condone giving people death threats, but honestly, I can understand why people got so pissed off. Because today's film has a 92% rating, and is one of my own personal favourites, and I can't help but feel annoyed that 8% of professional critics hate a movie I consider to be near perfect. I mean, one of the negative reviews comes from this guy, and he says, it's full of scenic splendours with a fine sense of scale. Well, alright. But its narrative thrust seems relatively pro forma, and I was bored by the battle scenes. This man was clearly high, but what I love to do is look at the results in comments. You gave a classic a rotten? Lol. And you call yourself a critic. He should call himself an arsehole. Haha, <laughs> yes, my faith in humanity is restored. After all, this same critic gave rotten ratings to The Matrix, The Last Crusade, and the original Star Wars. I rest my case. Okay, so now to my review when first a little info. The Lord of the Rings is a trilogy of fantasy adventure films running from 2001 to 2003 and they were brilliant because they set the standard for the fantasy film genre. Numerous films of this type have never quite matched the phenomena set by this trilogy as many that have been made post-2003 have often been described as the Lord of the Rings rip-offs. Hell, even when it comes to good fantasy films, TV shows and video games, we can't help but compare them to Peter Jackson's vision of a make-believe setting. Now, Lord of the Rings is often regarded as one of the greatest trilogies of all time. Everything from the memorable characters, the fascinating lore, the kick-ass action scenes and the incredible set design is all astounding. And it really did put New Zealand on the map. Somewhere I've actually been to, and really want to go back to as well, considering the filming locations are well documented. Wait a minute. Huh, I'll go now! Uh, l let's check prices of flights to New Zealand from the UK. Son of a bitch! Okay, so whilst I wait for a winning lottery ticket, I'm going to go ahead and take an in-depth look at each one. And let us start our three parts by taking a look at the first movie. This is The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring. Now most of you will be familiar with the opening dialogue and the fact that it has no visual aid. So to make up for that, I decided to edit in a few totally uncalled for examples. The world is changed. I feel it in the water. I feel it in the earth. I smell it in the air. So our narrator, the elf Galadriel, goes on to tell the origin of the Great Rings, which gave the wearers the strength and will to govern the races of Middle-earth. Three were given to the elves, immortal, wisest and fairest of all beings. A bit full of yourself there, Galadriel, calling elves the fairest, wisest race when you yourself are an elf. And that's not to mention you're on screen when you say it. How much more egocentric could you get? I mean, that's like me saying, and one ring was given to the race of man, the most handsome, intelligent, well-endowed species in the universe. Damn right. Oh, uh, I had no idea you could hear me. Well, of course I can. Wait, you sound familiar. Oh shit, gotta go. So the three people and the armies of Sauron duke it out on the slopes of Mount Doom, but it looks as though Sauron has the advantage. But Isildur, the son of the king, manages to defeat the Dark Lord by cutting off the ring from his hand. This leads to Sauron regretting he had that bean burrito for lunch. Okay, so a lot happens over the following 3,000 years, so listen up. An elf named Elrond tells Isildur to destroy the ring, and Isildur's like, No. And Elrond's like, Isildur! And Isildur's like, Fuck you, bitch, I got a ring. <laughs> and an arrow in the back. So the ring is lost for thousands of years and then a creature named Gollum who looks like Steve Buscemi really let himself go, finds it and keeps it for 500 years as it fucks with his man and eventually the ring fucks off because it's got a will of its own and before long a hobbit named Bilbo Baggins finds it as the ring spends a further 60 years with Bilbo as that finally brings us to present day. Everybody got that? 
Well, today sees Bilbo celebrating his 111th birthday as his old friend Gandalf the Great arrives for the celebrations. All I did was give your uncle a little nudge out of the door. Whatever you did, you've been officially labelled a disturber of the peace. Disturber of the peace? Man, Gandalf must be taking a risk strolling into the shower like he owns the joint. This could get messy. Well, let's see how the hobbits greet him. It's wonderful to see you, Gandalf! It's Gandalf! Good to see you. <laughs> I don't get it. Well, I, I guess he could have done something to make up. Maybe he performs local services for the town or something. Wait, I've got it. Gandalf is the Shire's equivalent to Santa Claus. Think about it. He gets animals to pull his transport. He's surrounded by short people with funny years. The kids go nuts after him. And come on, how can you look at the man and not see Jolly or Saint Nick? Ho ho ho. Merry, uh, well, whatever it is you celebrate in the Shire. Day. So the party is underway complete with drink, drugs and fireworks, which quite frankly should be outlawed. <laughs> But Bilbo is not enjoying shy life anymore and decides to act all weird like when he delivers his birthday speech. I regret to announce this is the end. The end of high prices at Bilbo Baggins' weed shop! Hey! We've got 50% of one bottom leaf, hey! South Farm, hey! and even all Tobin. Oh, um, I, I regret to inform everyone that we are out of stock on Old Toby. I know. Oh, what's that again? Oh, not to worry. Gandalf raided Saruman's supplies. There's enough Old Toby for everybody. But Bilbo decides to pull a prank and uses the ring to disappear, leaving everyone confused. Gandalf catches up with Bilbo, I guess he can apparate, as he attempts to convince him to leave the ring behind. But Bilbo's having none of it. I think you've had that ring quite long enough. You want it for yourself! Bilbo Baggins! Do not take me for some conjurer of cheap tricks. I am not trying to rob you. He's trying to scare the shit out of you. And judging by your face, I would say it worked quite well. Help me. So, yeah, that works, as Bilbo decides to leave the ring behind and goes to live with the elves so he can get some much needed peace and quiet. I've thought up an ending for my book. And he lived happily ever after. To the end of his days. Ah, oh, just like every story ever, pretty much. So Gandalf learns of the origins of the ring and explains to Bilbo's nephew Frodo that Sauron's soul is still very much alive. The spirit of Sauron endured. His life force is bound to the ring and the ring survived. So essentially a Horcrux then. Your Honor, I wish to sue Mr. Riddle for stealing my idea. Yeah, well, I took it a step further by split my soul several times up yours, Cochron. You have no nose. Your argument is invalid. Got rules in favor of Sauron. I want a pile of sh But servants of Sauron called the Ring Wraiths are looking for the ring as they are quickly approaching the Shire. So Frodo and Gandalf decide to split ways. Frodo and his best friend Sam will take the ring to the village of Bree, whilst Gandalf visits his fellow wizard Saruman for advice on what to do. For well, that is why you have come, is it not? My old friend. But we still have time. Time enough to counter Sauron if we act quickly. Time? What time do you think we have? Well, judging on how long these movies are, I'd say we have about... shitloads. So Saruman lets Gandalf know what Sauron is up to. Apparently he's now a big flaming eye sitting on top of a tower. Now I know that sounds kind of stupid, but if your soul was going to be represented by a single body part, I think the eye would be the coolest looking option. Could have been a hell of a lot worse. I doubt Saruman would have been able to argue otherwise if the gods chose to have him represented by another body part. <laughs> Very soon he will have summoned an army great enough to launch an assault upon Middle-earth. 
know this? How? I have seen it. In the script. But it turns out Saruman is evil. Okay, he's played by Christopher Lee. What did you expect? Well, anyway, the two fighters, Christopher Lee confuses his role in Star Wars here for a bit as he seemingly uses the Force to grab Gandalf's staff and proceeds to spin him around like a record player. But enough of Gandalf being an idiot, let's go back to Frodo and Sam who have just run into two mischievous hobbits named Merry and Pippin who have been stealing from a local farm. The four run away after being discovered as Sam knocks the other three over a hill and once they reach the bottom, they're all absolutely fine. <laughs> I guess the old Toby builds up quite the pain resistance over the years. Trust a brandy buck and a toque. What? That was just a detour. Hmm, we're almost out of the Shire now. Let's just hope for the sake of this movie's PG rating, there's no more drug references. The mushrooms! Well, before they can get even higher, a ring wraith shows up. But because I get tired of using the word ring wraith over and over again, I'm going to give each one their own names. That one's Jerry. So Jerry and his pals chase after the poor hobbits, but they quickly escape to the town of Bree. Hey, Peter Jackson's cameo. A fine piece of method acting there. Truly getting lost into his own personal, emotive persona. Yeah, what's up, Doc? Brilliant. So our group meet a mysterious individual named Strider, a friend of Gandalf who will guard the four hobbits until they reach the Alban city of Rivendell. Where are you taking us? Into the wild. <laughs> Might want to go for another take there, guys. Sorry. So the group camp for the night as Strider, and I quote, has a look around. And for some reason does stuff what seemingly seems like hours is Jerry and friends show up and wound Frodo. What the hell was Strider doing all this time? Scouting the area for dangers perhaps? Yeah, bang up the job you did of that, King of Gone Dark. So it turns out that Frodo was stabbed with a mogul blade and if not treating quickly enough, he could soon become known to the world as Jerry Jr. Hurry! We're six days from Rivendell! He'll never make it! Well, it seems to me that like the only way Frodo could possibly make it is if a fast horse and rider that knows someone who can heal Frodo suddenly appears out of no one. Hey, thank you! So yeah, Strider's love and chesty elf Arwen manages to find the group as she races to Rivendell with Frodo and Tur in order to save his life. And it's a beautiful day in the middle of what I mean, exciting start to the National Weather Top to Horse Race Rivendell Championship. And the rough as they come out of the tour and it's Jerry the Rim Rare from Pimla Sparkly by Neck over Oops, my zip is down. Fuel is back under the influence of Necros of Noxious. Dirty son of a bitch can see them all. We're back naked, bring up the rear. But then, because I want an asphalt flying on the outside to come down the wire. It's all asphalt off! So Arwen reaches the river and uses her water bending skills to dispose of Jerry and his Nazgul pals. Save him. Last of his me. Whoa. <laughs> Whatever Elrond said, there must have been some strong words. Well, let, let's put subtitles on, let's see what he said. Um. I don't know if come back to the light is the best choice of words here. In fact, it's probably the worst thing. You can say in this given situation, people on the verge of death will want to stay far away from the light as humanly possible. You asshole! Don't dash, Rick. And if you see a long tunnel, stay away from the light. Donkey. Donkey. So everyone else reaches Rivendell all fine and dandy. Hell, even Gandalf got a lift with Air Middle Earth. And yes, everyone always says, "Why don't the eagles just fly the Fellowship to Mordor?" Well, the eagles are taxis, people. You can't tell them what to do. Eagle! Where to, mate? Mordor, please, and step on it. Well, anyway, Strider and Arwen can now have some time alone, as they have a conversation in which the dialogue is so cheesy, it can be said in the common tongue. Seriously, imagine them saying lines like this in English. I would rather share one lifetime with you 
and face all the ages of this world alone. Um, Owen, have you ever heard of the concept of moving on? You're over 2,700 years old. Strider is 87. He surely can't be the only love you've ever had, uh, right? Well, okay, back to the plot, as Aaron has called a meeting with all the races of Middle-earth to discuss what to do with the ring. Strangers from distant lands, friends of old, you've been summoned here to answer the threat of Mordor. Complimentary tea and biscuits can be found in the main hall. So in this meeting, we discover that Strider is actually better known as Aragorn, as he is the last remaining heir of Isildur. But it raises an odd point. Listen to how his father's name relates to his own. He is Aragorn, son of Arathorn. Son of Jason Bourne, son of Riptorn, son of a kind of sweet corn. <laughs> I mean, if Gimli's father is called Gloin, I think it's pretty obvious what his father was called. <laughs> <laughs> Gerald! But as to who should destroy the ring brings up a heated debate, Frodo disperses the arguments by announcing that he will take the ring to Mordor, as Gandalf, Aragorn and three new companions, Legolas, Gimli and Boromir, join him along with Sam, Merry and Pippin to form the Fellowship of the Ring. You shall be the Fellowship of the Ring. Oh, that's why they call it that. But before they set off, Bilbo has a few items he'd like to give to Frodo. Me thrill. As light as a feather, and as hard as dragon scales. Let me see you put it on. Come on. Oh. You know, I was told there was something freaky around this point in the movie, but... <laughs> hell, in the UK this movie is rated a PG, so... I guess there's nothing too scary in this movie. I can just sit back and relax and... <laughs> oh, man. I can't believe they put on the page. Oh, great, I'm dead. Ugh. Those are not cheap. So after Frodo changes his pants, the fellowship begin their journey to Mordor. And let us take a moment to enjoy the holy fuckballs of awesome that is Howard Shaw. Let it build. Fellowship camp for lunch, it turns out that Saruman is keeping a close eye on them by using... Crabine from Dunland! What he said. So, Gandalf, you tried to lead them over Garadras. <laughs> uh, those crow things told you that? <laughs> Seems kind of an odd power for a wizard to have. The ability to speak to birds. I mean, what earth of interest would birds have to talk about? Hey Hedwig, tell me a joke. I immediately regret this. Do not disturb the water. Too late. Gimli already took a piss in the lake. I'm not even gonna bother telling you what I just did then. So Frodo works out the door's riddle as the group enter. Once in Moria, the Fellowship realises the mines were what they used to be as Gandalf tries to gather his bearings. Uh. Oh, something dropped. Uh. That where? But Pippin accidentally alerts the Orcs of Moria to the group's presence as the Fellowship prepare for the onslaught of Orcs onto their position. Anyone else here feel sorry for Aragorn? There's Legolas with his expertly crafted longbow passed down by elven kings of old. And Aragorn looks like he got his at a clear out sale at Toys R Us. I mean seriously, here's Aragorn. 
and he is legolas Dual arrow, motherfucker! <laughs> So the battle continues, but Frodo gets stabbed for the second time in one movie. Poor guy. As Legolas finishes off the troll. He's alive. I'm alright. I'm not hurt. You're not hurt? <laughs> well, what, what was with really bad constipation face here? Looked like you needed some Seneca or something. But upon leaving the room, the group are surrounded, but luckily for them, the orcs are scared away. Oh shit, it's that demon you mentioned earlier. Uh, you, you may want to run. What is this new devilry? Guys, he will eat your fucking heads off! Go on! Go on, 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 go on. I mean seriously, I timed it. They just stand there for a full minute. Get your thumbs out your asses and run like fuck. Well, ladies first. from the dwarf himself. I, I'm, I'm sorry, that was disgusting. Well, the group managed to reach the bridge, but Mr. Barog shows up for a battle with Gandalf. You cannot pass! Dark fire will not avail you! Flame of noon! Now, I am a fan of this scene, but to be perfectly honest, there's a big problem I have with it. You shall not pass! Holy fucking shit! Well, that was anticlimactic. Seriously, it's lame. He says that line with such conviction and the Balrog is just mildly annoyed with it. I mean, I know it does damage the bridge and that leads to the Balrog breaking it, but why not edit it like this? You shall not pass! But Gandalf goes down with the Barog and Frodo's like And after a quick sob to the music that for some reason the teaser trailer to Man of Steel uses, the rest of the fellowship reach the woods of Lothlorien, as Gimli tells Frodo of the Elven Queen which rules there. Here's one dwarf she won't ensnare so easily. I have the eyes of a hawk and the ears of a fox. Ooh. And the brain of a Kardashian. So the fellowship is taken to the Elven Queen Galadriel as everyone is captivated by her beauty. Everyone except the audience. Tell me where is Gandalf, for I much desire to speak with him. He has fallen into shadow. Well, that's a light way of putting it. But next time, skip the poetry and just say the fuck is dead. D E D. Dead. So during the night, Galadriel passes by and awakes Frodo as he follows her down to a mirror which can show the past, present and future. Look hard. So Frodo sees visions of a dystopian future of what would happen if he failed this quest. Doesn't look good. But Gladriel suddenly feels pressured into taking the ring as, well, this happens. In place of a dark lord, you would have a queen! Not dark, but beautiful and terrible as the dawn! What's the fuck? The sea! You know, I can't understand a word you're saying, right? All sound of me understand. I shall not mock you in this pair. Well, after that disturbing transformation into She-Hulk, the Fellowship continue their journey as Galadriel gives Frodo a passing gift. I give you the light of Erendil. 
our most beloved star. May it be a light for you in dark places when all other lights go out. Could have just given a, f a flashlight or something. Well, anyway, the group eventually reached the end of the river as Legolas's elven sense is tingling. A shadow under threat has been growing in my mind. Something draws near. I can feel it. We're almost two and a half hours into this movie and Sean Bean hasn't died yet. Something's wrong. And to make matters worse, Frodo has fucked off because, uh, well, uh, he, he was born, I guess. Frodo? <laughs> I swore to protect you. Can you protect me from yourself? Hey, if I do something stupid, I will kick the shit out of myself. So Frodo decides to leave the group, but uh, there's a little problem. Time to kick the walk the gloves. Wow, even Boromir is kicking ass. <laughs> Sean B may survive a movie after all. <laughs> oh. Well, you could survive on one lung, I guess. <laughs> His liver was probably damaged to hell already. <laughs> okay, he's dead. But before alerts here can deliver the killing blow, Aragorn shows up for a fight. <laughs> If I hear one more sound, remember, one more sound, and up comes your head. Comprenez-vous? Whoa, 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 whoa. Time out. Go back. Now keep your eye on this uruk here. Hey, Jim, did Jackson say cut? I got an itch. He's supposed to be dead! Yeah. Weird. They took the little ones. I'll never be able to have kids again, Aragorn. So Boromir sadly dies from the three arrows stuck in his vital organs, and Sam manages to catch up to Frodo before he leaves. I'm going to Mordor alone. Of course you are. And I'm coming with you. You can't swim. There, there's another canoe behind you. <laughs> Frodo, the human world, it's a mess. Life under the sea is better than anything they got up there. The seaweed is always greener in somebody else's lake. You dream about going up there, but that is a big mistake. Under the sea, under the sea. Darling, it's better down where it's wetter. Take it from me. Up on the shore, they work all day Out in the sun, they slave away While we're devoting full time to floating under the sea <laughs> God damn it, Frodo, I was at peace under the sea Put me back! So Frodo and Sam head off to Mordor together No doubt inspiring many romantic fan fictions over the following years As the rest of the fellowship say goodbye to Boromir Wait a minute, it was just a flesh wound Aragorn, get me out of this boat! I'm not there! Then it has all been in vain. The Fellowship has failed. What if we hold true to each other? We've got sequels to make, Legolas. High gross and Oscar winning sequels. We travel light. That is handsome. So Aragorn, Legolas and Gimli set off to kick some more flabby orc ass as the movie comes to a close. By God, now I want to watch the next one. That's just a testament to how awesome this trilogy is. Once I've watched one, I've got to watch the next one immediately after. And that's goodbye to my idea as I'll end up spending nearly 12 hours watching the extended editions of these movies. But to play devil's advocate, is there anything I don't like about Fellowship of the Ring? Well, yeah, but it's all nitpicking. For example, I never liked how Frodo can never stand up for himself. He can resist the power of the ring, but he's constantly getting his ass saved by everyone else when it comes to fighting the evils of Middle-earth. Now there are a few technical problems too. 
One is the sometimes dated CGI, but I'm not going to knock a movie for that because it was alright by 2001 standards and it was a problem that other big movies of the same year had. When I reviewed Philosopher's Stone I forgot to mention how utterly dreadful the CGI is in that movie. <laughs> anyway, the bad CGI was a problem they more than made up for with the sequels. Another problem is the dubbing. Again, it's not a deal breaker, but has anyone else noticed the amount of ADR work in these films and how obvious the dubbing can be? Oh, no you don't. Go on. <laughs> Seriously, it's like I'm watching a foreign language film dubbed into English at times. Characters can end up talking without even moving their lips. And lastly, yeah, the standing actors for The Hobbits are incredibly obvious, especially in HD. But of course this was a whole decade prior to Captain America, where they were able to keep the same face on a shorter actor. Me thinks they should use the same technology for The Hobbit. Now I know these films stray from the books a lot, introducing new characters and giving some different personalities, but honestly, I think every character works. Everyone is perfectly cast, though I hear a lot of people don't like how goofy they made Merry and Pippin, but I'm a fan of the change. They're immensely likeable and they deliver some nice light-hearted comedy to balance the film's occasional dark nature. The scene where Pippin goes on about second breakfast is just priceless. Now the movies are long, but honestly, I don't care. I'm so invested in every character and interested in every aspect of this movie, I would have liked to have seen it even more. Tom Bombadil for one, and maybe some more backstory for characters like Legolas and Gimli. I would have loved to have learnt more about these two, as they're the only elf and dwarf we spend any real time with, and through them we could have learned more about their respective races. But seriously, if you haven't seen these films, watch them now. There's so much I skipped in this review, there is seriously something for everyone here. They are long movies, so grab a cushion, get some popcorn, put your feet up and give them a watch. You won't regret it. Well... There is one thing about this movie I regret seeing. <laughs> oh man. Hey Pippin, got any suggestions? Mushrooms! Okay. Ugh. Movie trilogies. Why are there so goddamn many of them? I mean, it's pretty clear that movie directors must have wet dreams about the number three because the trilogy seems to be the preferred format for telling a multi film narrative these days. Whether the movies have separate or connected storylines, the trilogy seems to fit that beginning, middle, and end approach that all filmmakers learned about in filmmaking 101. They just simply want to employ that strategy in order to tell the given story in the best possible way. Oh, and three times the box office gross is nice too. However, when you go for that three film tactic, usually at least one of the movies sucks on tall amounts of ass. For every Mummy film we got Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, for every Matrix film we got The Matrix Revolutions, and for every Transformers film we got, um, every Transformers film. The point I'm trying to make here is that with most film trilogies, it's pretty easy to pinpoint the weakest and strongest film out of the three. Very few exist where all three films are so good that there's no universal answer which says which one is the best. I mean even some of the greatest film trilogies of all time don't pass this test. The Christopher Nolan Batman trilogy for example. All brilliant films but most people agree that Dark Knight is the best. The original Star Wars trilogy. Again, all great but most people put Return of the Jedi as their least favourite out of the bunch. Back to the Future. Neither part 2 or 3 could top the original. Or so goes the general consensus. Terminator. People frequently say Terminator 2 is the best. And Spider-Man? Well, Emo Peter kinda ruined part 3's chances, didn't it? We're gonna get to that one soon enough, don't you worry. Now I'm probably wrong when I say this, but I personally think only two film trilogies exist, where all three films are so good, people have to either think really hard or give up on choosing a favourite. One is Toy Story. The other? Well, you read the title of the video, right?
Now The Two Towers is easily one of my favourite sequels of all time. I remember going to the cinema to see this when I was 11 and it just blew my mind. The characters, the action, the humour, the music, the prosthetics, the revolutionary motion capture, it all adds up to one incredibly worthy follow up to Fellowship. Within literally the first few seconds of watching part 2, I knew I was in for a treat. So why did I come to that conclusion? Well, let's find out. This is The Lord of the Rings The Two Towers. First off, listen to this opening music. The way that piece just slowly builds up gives me such goosebumps. It had been a year since I last visited Middle Earth. That music immediately brought me back. It's basically the equivalent of Peter Jackson jumping on screen just to say, I'm back, baby. So the second chapter begins, oddly enough, in the middle of the first, as Gandalf battles with the Balrog. Didn't end well, did it? <laughs> Hmm, pull yourself up a ledge, or take your chances against a 10,000 year well fire breathing demon of the underworld. <laughs> Makes sense to me. So just in case you thought you were watching a copy of the first film, the perspective changes a lesson. Holy fucking shit is this awesome. and quite possibly the most badass way to open a film ever. How do they choose to go to the next scene? Randolph. By having our main character tell us it was all a dream. So, did Gandalf's battle with the Barrock happen like that or not? You know, I've always wondered this. How could Frodo have known what happened? The way I see it, either A, this is what Frodo's subconscious thought could have happened, B, this is exactly what happened and Frodo has a sort of spiritual connection to Gandalf, I'll see. Frodo has been smoking too much pipe weed. What do you know about it? Nothing. So we meet back up with Frodo and Sam as they continue their journey to Mount Doom. <laughs> Mr. Frodo? It's the ring, isn't it? Yeah, you shouldn't have had that curry last night. Okay, that's the last ring joke, I swear to God. <laughs> It's not my fault, blame this guy. Ah, Frodo, you're hurting me! <laughs> when I said you should destroy the ring. So the two hobbits camp for the night as the creature Gollum shows his ugly rear and tries to take the ring. And whilst I pray that his loincloth is more practical than it looks, the two hobbits get the drop on him as Frodo Patek's the only badass thing he ever does in the whole trilogy. This is Sting. You've seen it before, haven't you, Gollum? Hmm, what to do with him? Any ideas, Donkey? I say we take the sword and neuter him right here. Give him the Bob Barker treatment. No! That would kill us. Kill us! It's no more than you deserve. Maybe he does deserve to die. Brilliant! Grab his legs! But now that I see him, I do pity him. Oh, um... Well, he did just try to kill you, but you're the boss. So because Gollum has previously been to Mordor, Frodo convinces him to lead them there as their guide. Meanwhile, Aragorn, Legolas and Gimli's pursuit of the Uruk pack has brought them to Rohan. Legolas, what do your elf eyes see? The Uruks turn northeast. They're taking the hobbits to Isengard. <laughs> Okay, if that damn remix starts playing again, I'll never be able to finish this review. Shut up! Wait a minute. The Uruks turn northeast. Northeast? Okay, here's the map for Middle Earth. They're currently in Rohan heading towards Isengard. Shouldn't they be turning northwest? Legolas, what do your elf eyes see? Apparently. This should have gone a spec savers. <sighs> Together, my lord Sauron, we shall rule this middle earth. Wow, never knew Saruman was like gullible. Come on, people, if Sauron did succeed in taking over Middle Earth, do you really reckon he'd share his rule? 
they'd resurrect Sauron, he'd check his list on things to do, priority number one, kill his biggest threat to world dominance. Dwee. So Saruman's forces wreak havoc all over Rohan as its king known as Thaden is powerless to do anything about it. Yeah, watching Antiques Roadshow will do that to you. If we don't defend our country, Saruman will take it by force. That is a lie. Saruman the White has ever been our friend and ally. Hey, I didn't know Jack White was in this picture. <laughs> okay, but seriously. How did this guy end up with the position of King's advisor? I mean, look at him! Who on earth thought it would be a good idea to hire a man who looks like the love child of Senator Palpatine and Tommy Wiseau? It just doesn't make any sense. Not to mention his name. Grima Wormtongue. I want to repeat that. Grima Wormtongue. Nobody thought it might have been a mistake to let a man with that name anywhere near the King. Mm -hmm. But hey, in the meantime, why not hire, may kill you in your sleep for the role of King's bodyguard, will poison the water for the role of King's personal chef, and Chris Brown is marriage counsellor. <laughs> so yeah, Wormtongue is in command, so he banishes the King's nephew, Aemir, under pain of death. We then cut to Merry and Pippin later at night, as they're a little cautious to where the Uruks have camped. What's making that noise? Yeah, they're called drugs. Dude, the trees are talking to me again. No way. Way. It's blocking the way, dude. How do we get past it? Oh, well, s some chick who lives next to a gym said we should use this. Dude, if someone in the comments got that reference, then they're fucking awesome. I'm starving. We ain't had nothing but maggoty bread for three stinking days. That's what I get for shopping at Netto. Mm. Why can't we have some meat? <laughs> okay, play that again. Why can't we have some meat? <laughs> I, I don't know why, but I just freaking love that line. I mean, it just must be the way he says it or something. Why can't we have some meat? Why can't we have some meat? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that has to catch on as some kind of phrase we can all use. We could put it on t-shirts, mugs, all sorts of merchandise. Hell, wouldn't that be a great slogan for epic mealtime? It would fit perfectly with that love of bacon. Hell, I can see this phrase closing out every film imaginable as a way to say, yeah, that was a good movie, now let's eat. <laughs> Um, Mr. Ork, one does not simply eat hobby leg. Have you seen their feet? You'll be carving up more hairballs than Snowball fucking two eating that shit. I mean, it's not like you're gonna get hairy hobbit leg on the menu at Mordor Subway Branch anytime soon. Get your own hairy hobbit leg melt, and you it's five dollar foot long. Sure, those hobbit hairs may clog up your digestive system, but you're all such vile, hungry bastards, you'll eat anything. New Hobbit Leg. Subway. Eat flesh. They look tasty. Get back, Snow! But before long, the two hobbits are saved by the Rohirrim, though Pippin presumably gets trampled by a bullseye here. <laughs> On the bright side, his bounds were cut magically between shots, but I digress. Back with Aragorn and Cutler, the trio run into Aemir, who, despite being banished forthwith from the kingdom of Rohan, under pain of death, is still in Rohan and perfectly alive. Okay. The white wizard is cunning. He walks here and there, they say. Wow. I mean, could you get any more of a vacant description of what he does? He walks here and there, they say. He breathes and eats occasionally. They say he hears and smells things sometimes and that he likes to take a dump about once every 24 hours, give or take. Ooh. I know, truly not specimen. So AML lets them know of Barry and Pippin's supposed fate. Upon giving the trio two horses, yes, two horses for three people, ass, 
They make their way to the Uruk carcasses, things don't look too good. A bit of trivia here, apparently Viggo Mortensen broke a toe kicking that helmet and that take you see in the actual movie is the very one in which his toe broke. The scream he lets out was sort of channeled by the pain and due to its emotional effectiveness, Jackson decided to use Viggo's improvisation in the final cut. Pretty impressive acting, though I'm never going to watch that scene the same ever again. That's gotta hurt. So it turns out Mary and Pippin actually escaped and ran into Fangorn Forest with an orc on their tail. Mary's ingenious plan of escape? Trees. Climb a tree. Climb a tree. Of course. Orc's biggest weakness. Everybody knows that. <laughs> he don't seriously now think he's gone. He's gone. Turns out Orc is not gone in three, two, one. Talk and kill! Play that again. That's disgusting. So Mary and Pippin are quickly saved by Treebeard and enter Fangon Forest. Tree herder? A shepherd of the forest. Don't talk to it, Mary. Don't encourage it. Don't encourage it, Mary. Or to eat all the haggis. Okay, sorry to all the Scots out there. It's just that after hearing Pippin's awesome Scottish accent, I just want to see that Visit Scotland advert again. Hell, wouldn't it be great if Middle Earth got its own advert in that style? Scotland might surprise you. There's more than one way to see our sights. And hear our sounds. We've always done our own thing. And followed our own path. You don't have to join a club here. Just bring a club. Or a wetsuit. And don't bother bringing binoculars. The natives are friendly all right. And our welcome is warm. Very warm. Wherever you land. And can you honestly think of a better place to have a wee nightcap before you turn in? So this year, surprise yourself. Visit Scotland. So Aragorn and Cook continue their search for Merry and Pippin when they run into an old friend. You fell. Through fire. And water. From the lowest dungeon to the highest peak, I fought him the power of the Morgoth. Okay, stop. I have to address this. Has anyone ever noticed that the letter R is the most evil letter in the alphabet? Want to know why? Well, it's because you can roll the R sounds, make it sound really epic. And this is what Tolkien did. Practically every evil thing in this movie has an R in its title. Have you ever noticed? This is so every actor in these movies can roll the R to make the evil thing sound more menacing. And here's proof. Mordor, Orthanc, the Balrog of Morgoth. Kirith Ungol, Sauron, Saruman. I can keep going. Urukai, Orc, Gorgoth, Baradur, the Palantir, Chris Brown. Okay, sorry, get ahead of myself, but you get the point. So Gandalf explains in literally two sentences of exposition that Merry and Pippin are safe and that it is Rohan that needs their help. So Gandalf calls the aid of an old friend of his. Shadow Facts. Son of Shadow the Hedgehog and a fax machine. do ask. So after Frodo's company failed to get into Mordor, Gollum lets them know of another entrance they can try, as Gandalf's group reach Edoras, as he attempts to break Saruman's grasp on Theoden. 
You have no power here, Gandalf the Grey. Behold the power of vanished Oxyax! Trust Pink Bucket Stein's bitch! Don't touch me. So Gandalf's 40 degree wash cycle apparently did the trick as Theoden starts to get a lot better. Still I've always thought this cross dissolve thing they used here was a little lame. To be fair, they should have gone with something like this. Fingers would remember their own strength better if they grasped your sword. That's what she said! Hey, Faden, you know what would definitely make you feel better? Violence. Yes, Aragorn is right. I mean, it's not like I'll go back to Saruman and tell him what we're most likely to do next send a pack of wargs and 10,000 Urukai killers on take over all of Rohan or anything. No, letting him go is the smart thing to do. Oh, my sarcasm machine just blew the fuck up. Oh, in Brazil that means you're an asshole. So yeah, they let Grima go, and stay in order as the residents of Edoras to make their homes deep, a fortress where they should be safer. In the meantime, Aragorn gets to know the king's niece Eowyn a bit. I fear neither death nor pain. What do you fear, my lady? A cage. Hey! Whoa! Why the hell did you turn up all she said was cage? Hey! So what, are you just gonna pop up now every time I say the word cage? Hey! <sighs> Note to self, don't say the C word. No, 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 no not that C word. I was talking about cage. Hey! God. Lord help me if I want to review a movie by Nicholas, you know. So we cut back to Frodo and Sam continuing their journey to Mordor staff only entrance as Gollum is having a bit of a mental breakdown. Master's my friend. Friend. You don't have any friends. Nobody likes you. Not listening. Not listening. Huh. That's weird. I said the exact same thing when I heard Soldier Boy for the first time. You're a liar. And a thief. Nope. <laughs> I don't know why, but I just love the way Smeagol just says, Nope, there. Nope. He's like he's being playfully teased about something. All the cake is gone. Smeagol, you ate the last of the cake, didn't you? Didn't you? So Smeagol decides to stand up for himself and orders his evil sign to leave and never come back. Leave now and never come back. We, we told him to go away. And away he goes. Stop. Smeagol time. So Smeagol celebrates by bringing Frodo dinner. <laughs> needs a bit of seasoning. What we need is a few good taters. What's taters, Brussels? What's taters, huh? Potatoes. Oh. Boil them, mash them, stick them in a stew. Sam, what is in the house? Boil them, mash them, stick them in a stew. Boil them, mash them, stick them in a stew. Potato, potato. Boil them, mash them, stick them in a stew. Boil them, mash them, stick them in a stew. Boil them, mash them, stick them in a stew. Boil them, mash them, stick them in a stew. You gotta boil and mash and stick them in a stew Eat that shit like a Scooby Doo You gotta turn up the heat if that's what you make. That stew we're gonna ask for some crispy bacon And whilst we're at it, I'ma lay it real thick Go and put the pasta for a see you <sighs> <sighs> Moving on 
So Frodo hears something off in the distance and goes off to investigate it with Sam being none the wiser. Remind us what you said in the first movie, Sam. I made a promise, Mr. Frodo. A promise. Don't you leave him, Samwise Gamgee. And I don't mean to. I don't mean to. Mr. Frodo? Sam does eventually find Frodo, though, but are quickly captured by a ranger called Faramir and his band of merry men. Fagalus? Back in Rohan, however, Saruman has sent a pack of warg riders to attack the Edoras residents, as we finally get our first real battle scene in this movie. Took a while. <laughs> ah, what was it Thaden said earlier? I will not bring further death to my people. <laughs> But during the battle, Aragorn finds himself in quite the predicament. Tell Cronenberg I love him! Aragorn! Aragorn! Uh, thank you, trailer. He quite clearly showed Aragorn in a clip I haven't seen, so I know he's fine. Also, the next movie's poster has his noggin all over it. So, unless there's a really good human taxidermist around, I'm willing to bet he's fine. I mean, look, it's clearly Aragorn. No, it's just Chuck Tester. Huh. I, I took a little tumble off the cliff. <laughs> you lie. <laughs> Jesus Christ, man, Orlando Bloom's acting isn't that bad. Hmm. I wonder what Legolas is thinking right now. So the rest of the group reach Edoras as Gimli tells Eowyn the bad news. Lord Aragorn. Where is he? Okay, Eowyn. This may be hard to take, but, uh... You know that guy you've shared... Two scenes with? Phil. Okay, okay, stop. <laughs> Seriously, what is with that scene? Eowyn and Aragorn barely know each other and it's been established they aren't lovers. Characters don't have a misfit in other movies when they're told someone they barely know dies. Okay, Luke, I hate to be the one to tell you this, but uh, you know that canteen owner you wanted a drink from that one time? He's dead! No! But on the right side, Jar Jar is alive. Oh, he just topped himself. <laughs> Back in Gondor, though, Faramir interrogates Frodo as Sam delivers one hell of a combat line. Frodo Baggins is my name, and this is Samwise Gamgee. Your bodyguard? <laughs> His gardener. You're a friend of Faramir? Yes. You know, despite the fact that he tried to kill me, betray me, possibly rape me, steal the ring, use it for his own personal gain, and subsequently doom all of Middle Earth and all of his inhabitants for all eternity. But other than that, he was my BFF for life. So it turns out Faramir is Boromir's brother. But once he finds out what Frodo and Sam are up to, Faramir is like, the room will go to Gondor, na 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 na. As Aragorn makes it back to Helm's Deep by opening the door like a boss. <laughs> That's seriously how I open all double doors now. It's so badass. Still, it can go terribly wrong. Guys. Doors locked. Let me in. Great host, you say? All Isengard is emptied. How many? 10,000 strong at least. 10,000. It's over 9,000! Yes, we can count. So Thayda decides to make a stand and sends all who can wield a sword to the armory. Well, anyone who can wield a sword and also has a penis. Yeah, in this world women are apparently so useless in combat, 
bodies as young as this kid apparently have a better chance of survival. I mean, I don't get it. I mean, check out what Eowyn says earlier. The women of this country learned long ago. Those without swords can still die upon them. The women are encouraged to learn how to fight. And now that the time has come for them to fight, they've instead been told to sit on their fat asses, whilst their sons who haven't even fucking hit puberty yet are the ones that are doing the goddamn fighting. Ugh. King Theoden, he's a sexist ass. King. So, yeah, the night arrives, but morale is about as non-existent as Megan Fox's acting abilities. But fear not, we have a wise old elf in our ranks. So tell us, Master Elf, what is going to happen to all these men? Not the Dagathire. Yeah, Rohan! Ugh. I mean, good God, Legolas, that was bloody dire. Can you imagine what would have happened if he said that in English? <coughs> We're all gonna die! <coughs> So because Legolas is suddenly concerned about being outnumbered, which is strange given how he never battered an island when being outnumbered before, Aragorn finds a moment for himself. Give me a sword. I want to give you a haircut. <laughs> Seriously that, I'm glad they did get a girl to fight. What is your name? Hollis, son of Hamel. <laughs> son? The men are saying that we will not live out the night. They say that it is hopeless. You know, showing off isn't the best way to give a person hope, you inconsiderate ass muncher. This is a good sword. That's not a good sword. It looks like a piece of cardboard somebody glued tinfoil onto. What's going to be your method of attacking the Urukai pit to cut them to death? You're hopeless. So Aragorn has a bit of fun suiting up in the most epic way possible, as Legolas wants to apologise for his we're all gonna die speech he gave earlier. We have trusted you this far, you have not led us astray. I take it you've never heard of the phrase, there's a first time for everything then? I mean, why the sudden change of heart? Like you said, 300 against 10,000. This is Sparta! Right. I mean, it's not like you're gonna get a battalion of elves knocking on the door, proud to fight alongside men once more. We are proud to fight alongside men once more. Huh. Well, um. Hey, uh. You. Okay, you can tell us was not the intended character to lead this group of elves here. This guy had like one line in Fellowship. How is he relevant to the story? Want to know who was supposed to lead this battalion of elves in earlier script drafts? She was actually supposed to do something in this movie. This was supposed to be how Aragorn got the Anduril sword, but because it's deviated from the book and the subsequent fan outrage this caused, she was replaced by that guy. I mean, why did the fans want her cut? I know Arwen didn't have a big role in the books, but what we saw of her in the previous film was such a tease. She summoned the horses from the Guinness advert and single-handedly wiped out the supposedly undefeatable ring rips. All of them in one go. Just imagine the damage she could have caused at Helm's Deep. But no, instead she's probably back at Rivendell making Arwen a sandwich or something. Feminism for the win. <laughs> so everyone with a pair of fairy meatballs gets into position as the Uruks arrive and start doing some strange battle chat. You do realise there's an all-you-can-eat buffet of men and elk me just a few hundred yards ahead of you, right? Kill him! Ooh, nice shot! You got that Urukai reenacting Asta for movie now! Everybody do the flop! 
I mean, I know he wasn't supposed to shoot yet, but according to what Legolas says, that's precisely their weak spot. <laughs> Just have Chris Kringle here be a one-man army. You haven't seen the last of us! You've seen the last of us. <laughs> so the Uruk's charging with ladders which are appear the fuck out of nowhere, as Gimli couldn't be happier. Legolas! Two already! I'm on 17! Ah! I have no point to yell out, spy me! Ah! Oh, damn! <laughs> Does that count as two? <laughs> so the battle continues as Thaden's getting a little too confident. Is this it? Is this all you can conjure, Saruman? <laughs> okay. I just want to see the Uruks cut him off mid-sentence, just so I can see what a complete ass he is. Is this it? Is this all you can conjure, Sarah? <laughs> so the Uruks break through to the grounds as Aragorn orders the reserve elves to attack. Why he doesn't just tell them to stay back and fire their arrows from a safe distance, I have no idea. As Aragorn picks up Gimli as Legolas. Oh, 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 I know what's coming up. I've just had an idea. Oh, um, mm, yeah, better ask permission first, um, hmm. I just don't understand why you're so upset. Well, because you didn't come to my place. Hello? I'm stealing one of your jokes, suck it! So back in Fangorn, Merry tries to convince the Ents to go to war, but Treebeard acts like a pussy as Merry tells Pippin of what could happen if they don't help. The fires of Isengard will spread, and the woods of Tukbro and Buckland will burn. There won't be a Shire, Pippin. Huh. This looks pretty bad. Was that Pippin? You want to lead Treebeard to the edge of the forest so we can see what Simon has wrought? Then why do you say so? To the end, Mobile! <laughs> but things aren't looking too good in Helm's Deep as Aragorn is ordered to retreat all of his men. Haldir, that's what his name was. Uh, well, I'm glad he has a name. For a second there, I thought you were going to bring back a character with barely no honor to kill him off or something. Oh. Poorly developed side character, no! Aha, it's over, Aragorn. I have a high ground. Oh, son of a bitch! But alas, a large metal axe stuck in your brain matter is hard to repair. Rest in peace, that guy. So back with Frodo and co, Faramir have taken them towards Giliath, and it's just about to send the two hobbits to his father. You want to know what happened to Boromir? You want to know why your brother died? Uh, might have something to do with the fact that he was played by Sean Bean. He tried to take the ring from Frodo. After swearing an oath to protect him, he tried to kill him. The ring drove your brother mad. <laughs> okay, Sean. You had way too much fun reading that line, didn't you? I just love the way he says mad. The ring drove your brother mad! 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 mad. Hey Sean, when this review is over, I want to show you my collection of mad. magazine. Then later we could watch mad. Max and catch up with the latest episode of mad. Men. And finally we could get around to seeing it's a mad. 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 world. It'll be fun! Mad. Okay, stop now. Mad. Whoa! Faramir suddenly sprung into action. He opened his mouth so far there, I thought he was gonna fire his laser. Nice. Back in Helm's Deep though, things had gone from shit to... smellier shit, as the Uruks have forced the remaining men to treat to the keep. Is there no other way for the women and children to get out of the caves? Is there no other way? There is one passage. It leads into the mountains. 
and you chose not to tell anybody about this way out of a supposedly inescapable fortress because? Seriously, what in the name of Oxgrome is wrong with these people? You didn't think it might be a good idea to send the women and children away before the battle started? You know, just in case you lost, you miserable pieces of dick cheese. You stupid, ignorant, son of a bitch, dumb bastard! Jesus Christ, I've met some dumb bastards in my time, but you outdo them all. Get over there! So yeah, because it's looking like they're gonna die, they prepare to ride out whilst Gimli blows the horn of Helm Hammerhand for the last time. Now for Wrath, now for Ruin, and the Red Dawn! Enough, Gimli. So the group ride out, and whilst these Uruks seemingly do nothing, Gandalf shows up with the Rohirrim and lay waste to all the remaining Urukai. Back in Osgiliath, though, Frodo's been a bit of a twat. <laughs> you know, this is confusing me here a bit. What did Aragorn say in the first movie? At all times they feel the presence of the ring, drawn to the power of the one. They will never stop hunting you. So, yeah, we have one ring wraith here. Where are the other eight? What is this their off day so they can pursue other activities? Did Jerry get his driver's license? Did Steve want to follow his lifelong ambition of starting a jazz band? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and another one goes to the slow mo pile. Freakiest thing I've ever seen. I can't do this, Sam. Okay, what's with those really odd line deliveries by Elijah Wood? Why does he talk so slowly all of a sudden? It's really weird. What will I see? I can't do this, Sam. Why do I sound like Kristen Stewart with bipolar depression? I'm acting. So Frodo, Sam and Gollum are released from captivity as Gandalf wants to get in a last minute poetic plug for the next movie. Sauron's wrath will be terrible, his retribution swift. His eye will be ever watching, and his lands will be full of shit. Damn. Well, Snape, there's thousands upon thousands of orcs who reside there. Do you see any toilets across the plains of Gorgoth? Mordor's full of shit. Literally. Explains what Boromir said in the previous movie. The very air you breathe is a poisonous fume. He was talking about farts. All our hopes now lie with two little hobbits. So back with these two young hobbits, Gollum is seriously not well. I was always watching. Then we stab them out. Make him crawl. Is Smeagol even listening? I mean, Gollum has practically taken over. Smeagol would just about agree to anything. Kill your hobbit sheesh. Yes. Take back the precious. Yes. Put it on eBay. Yes. Wait, what? He could not do it. So Gollum cooks up a plan to have a giant spider named Aragog, I mean Shulub, kill the two hobbits so we can take back the ring. But if you want to see that, you're going to have to wait a bit as the movie comes to a close. And there's the two towers, and I made it throughout the whole review without making a single 9-11 reference. Unless that counts. Oh, so you already know I adore the hell out of this movie, but there is a few minor things wrong here that I feel I should address. Now, you've already heard me talk about things like Aragorn's fake out death, the spoiler-filled trailers, and him, but there's some others. First off, the Ents. I don't like them. So do all the tree lovers out there, but with the exception of the Isengard attack, the scenes with them are a bit of a drag. You're experiencing something awesome like the Battle of Helm's Deep. You're sitting on the edge of your seat watching Aragorn, Legolas and Gimli kick multitudes of orc ass, and all of a sudden, they cut to long boring conversations with Treebeard, who speaks incredibly slowly and who you can barely understand. It's not a deal breaker, because I still enjoy these scenes. It's just that when watching them, I can't help but just sit there thinking to myself, can we go back to Legolas shield boarding down some stairs, please? Thank you. 
Another problem I have is this. The stakes could have been higher. Now what I mean by that is that when you compare the two towers to its predecessor, the characters have it easier. Yeah, really. Let me explain. In Fellowship, Gandalf dies, Boromir dies, Frodo almost dies, twice, Merry and Pippin get captured and the Fellowship is left devastated. In the second movie, Gandalf comes back, Merry and Pippin are rescued by a magical talking tree. It happens. Frodo never gets hurt, at least not physically, and the only characters that do die are ones we barely know. It's just that the stakes are really high, just not for the main characters. For example, at Helm's Deep, nearly everyone dies, except for everyone we care about. At the Isengard attack, Treebeard says, It is likely that we go to our doom. Yet they seem to take over Orthanc with ease, with not one end having an on-screen death. The closest you ever get is this one who gets set alight, but then you quickly see him put out the fire in the river water. I just think the movie could have had one or two more deaths, like have Thaden die in two towers instead, and part of the story of the next film could have been how Eomer was coming to terms with being the new King of Rohan, and therefore being the one to lead his people to war. Two towers could have been Thaden's story, Return of the King could have been Eomer's, but that's just an idea. Now my final and probably biggest issue with the film concerns the female characters and how in this movie they don't do shit. I mean Arwen revives Aragorn and Eowyn looks out for the people of Helm's Deep but I feel that's just relegating the women to roles the men can't be bothered with. The reason why I bring this up is that Peter Jackson actually intended both Eowyn and Arwen to fight. The crew had actually filmed scenes of them both battling Uruks at Helm's Deep. Eowyn was supposed to be holding off what Uruks broke through to the caves, and Eowyn was supposed to be fighting alongside Aragorn. There's even proof of the latter in the final cut. If you look closely at the scene where Eomer and Gandalf charging with Urahirum, you can just about see Eowyn fighting in the background wearing pink and riding a white horse. Now I can understand cutting these scenes for time, but they don't even make appearances in the extended edition. But then again, there are a few infamous scenes which never made it into any cut of the movie like Faramir's vision of a shall we say golem fight Frodo or where Sauron comes back and fights Aragorn in Return of the King. But I don't really count the lack of these scenes as a negative, I just think it's evident of my love of this trilogy and how I always want to see more from Middle Earth. I mean, a Return of the King sequel will never happen. Oh, I, I only say that because I said Star Wars Episode 7 would never happen in my Deathly Hallows Part 2 review and well you know how that turned out. But now I want to get to the stuff I do like, and where do I begin? The opening scene is my favourite intro to a movie ever. The action is fantastic, the CGI is revolutionary and surpasses some films even made to this day, but it's not overused. They use prosthetics wherever they can, and the work they do in the orcs in Urukai is just amazing, unlike the awful CGI orcs of The Hobbit. Yeah, let's be honest people, they look like shit. In this movie, they're scary, they're disgusting, yet they're strangely humorous to listen to. Instead of just being random things to kill, they actually have things to say. It's just funny listening to them moan about their maggoty bread and how Orcs and Urukai apparently don't get along very well. I also like how this movie gives Legolas and Gimli some more screen time. Their banter between each other is just so funny. It's worth paying extra for the extended editions just to see more of these two. I think you may have figured out that Legolas and Gimli are my favourite characters. But I gotta give credit where it's due as Sam is given a lot of time to shine here as well. Many consider Sam to be the real hero of these movies, and I agree. It's like Frodo says, Frodo wouldn't have got far without Sam. More like Frodo would have been dead in the first five minutes of this film if it weren't for Sam. But it's not just the character that's awesome. Sean Astin just plays him brilliantly. The speech he gives in us Gilead is one of the trilogy's greatest moments. It's a real shame you don't see Astin in more movie roles. Apart from the Goonies, The Lord of the Rings is the only thing I know him from. It's not right. Hollywood, give this guy more work, he bloody deserves it. But back to the movie, and pretty much every positive I gave Fellowship stands here too. The score is wonderful, the sets are bloody brilliant, the cast continues to shine. I just can't find something in these films that really bugs me. Two Towers, in my opinion, is just as good as Fellowship, and is right up there with Terminator 2 and Empire Strikes Back as one of the greatest second parts ever made. I'm the unusual suspect, and... I'm off to get Samwise Gamgee a record deal. Boiler mash up terminus two. Boiler mash up terminus two. Potato, potato. Boiler mash up terminus two. Boiler mash up terminus two. Boiler mash up terminus two. Boiler mash up terminus two.
I'm about to do a scene by scene review of a four hour film. If this is the first of my videos you have ever come across, then I will miss the 10 seconds we just share together. For the rest of us, Lord of the fucking Rings, what the? Yep, it's about bloody time we wrap this franchise up, isn't it? And what a film to do it with. Rack number 9 on the IMDb Top 250, winner of 4 BAFTAs, 4 Golden Globes, 11 goddamn Oscars! Impressive. But this is a review, so I have to ask, is Return of the King deserving of all this praise? Yes. Okay, you got me. Uh, but for the sake of argument, let's ask the question anyway. Is Return of the King deserving of all this praise? Yes. Is Return of the King deserving of all this praise? That I will answer at the end of this review. This... Oh god. <laughs> well, let's cut the BS and get down to brass stacks. So, grab yourself a cushion, go buy yourself a big gob and go for a quick whiz while you can. This is The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King. So our movie begins in a flashback as we arrive at a rather pleasant setting as two hobbit cousins named Deagle and a still kind of peculiar looking but much healthier looking Smeagol are having themselves a day out fishing when Deagle catches something so strong it actually pulls him into the water. In Soviet Middle Earth, fish catch you? But Deagle actually comes across the One Ring as the temptation of it quickly gets to Smeagol as he kills Deagle and begins his um, golemfication process. Okay, forgive me for making such a crude comparison, but as I watched this scene, I begin to realise how similar the One Ring is to a butthole. It's round, small, you feel a strange sensation as you rub it, you shouldn't really show it to people, and if you stick your finger through it, you end up in deep shit. So after our opening act, Lord of the Rings Origins Gollum, we cut the present day. Frodo's company is getting out close to Mordor, and Merry and Pippin are talking a little bit of the old Toby to celebrate a battle well fought at Isengard. You young rascals! A merry hunt of leather son, and now we find a feasting and, and smoking! We are shitting. I beg your pardon? We are shitting. Yeah, that's what I thought you said. <laughs> Hobbits. The salted pork is particularly good. Salted pork. Okay, what is it with Lord of the Rings and its random yet kind of quirky food references? You could create a rendition of my favourite things from The Sound of Music purely out of what Lord of the Rings characters say. I know that because that's what I did. Salted pork, then butter, just tea, crispy bacon, pine weed, potatoes, mushrooms, roast chicken, lovely big chips with a nice piece of fried fish. These are a few of my favorite things. So I saw the orcs and urks have been taken care of. I guess that still leaves Saruman to deal with. No, he has no power anymore. Ah, no, you don't. Even a defeat, Saruman is dangerous. There we go, now you're making sense. What do you want, Gandalf Grey Aim? Let me guess, the key of all thank? Okay, I do love this scene, but am I the only one who's a bit confused as to how Saruman and these guys down here are able to hear each other? I looked this up, apparently the Tower of Orthanc is 500 feet tall. No matter how loud you shout it, you cannot have a conversation with someone who's that high up. And I didn't see him use an amplifying charm like in Harry Potter. But you know this, don't you, Gandalf? I, I, am I the only one who's not getting a word of this? Gandalf does not hesitate to sacrifice those... Yo, Gandalf, can you tell them to speak the fuck up? No. I've heard enough. Shoot him. It's like you read my mind, Gimli. <laughs> there he goes! 
So the group head back to Rohan to celebrate the destruction of Saruman's spine as we cut to Frodo and co as Gollum appears to be having a bad dream. And I always like to think he's dreaming about Jedward here. Kill them. Kill them. Kill them both. <laughs> it's the little things. Alright, well Gollum's still pissed off with the Hobbit shiz, so he hatches a plan to get a giant spider named Shelob to attack Frodo and Sam. And in the commotion, Gollum will make off with a ring. To the winding star. Yes, the stars, and then up, 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 up the stairs we go until we come to the tunnel. <laughs> Gollum would make a great voice via GPS, wouldn't he? But then again, Gollum would Smingle would probably fight over whether you should make a left turn or a right one, and then you just crash. Then. We will find it and take it for me! <laughs> What's with the way Smeagol said me then? Me! It's like he just let out a really proud fart. And take it for me! <laughs> yes, you look very nice. So Sam overhears Gollum's plan to murder them and uh, takes the news well. <laughs> But Frodo manages to calm him down because he chooses to believe the story of a slimy deranged creature who's tried to kill him before over what his best friend just told him. You, sir, are an idiot. Well, let's just ignore Frodo's essential death wish and head back to Rohan as everyone's getting a good night's sleep. That is except for Pippin as he wants another look at Saruman's plant here, Gandalf having taken it from him earlier. So he decides to act out his favourite scene from Raiders to get it. Pippin, no one should be this enthusiastic about filling up an old man's ball. So yeah, Pippin eventually finds out that stealing an item of tempting supernatural power wasn't such a hot idea. Pippin! You know, as I watch this, I can only imagine how stupid Billy Boyd must have felt. You know, to take a green screen spear in hand and just shake it like this. <laughs> Also, I just recently noticed that despite all this commotion, Gimli is still fast asleep. I love that. And considering his antics from last night, can't say I'm surprised. So yeah, Gandalf brings Pippin around, it turns out that he just pulled a homer as through what he saw, Gandalf was able to determine that Sauron plans to attack Minas Tirith, a thousand year old city of men, which is apparently governed by a crazy man. So think of it as the London of Gondor. Something for the road. Last of the long bottom leaf. I know you've run out. You smoke too much, Pip. So to curb your addiction, I'm giving you even more. I'm a good friend. So Gandalf sets off with Pip in a warm gondor of the coming attack, and one scene later, they find themselves at Minas Tirith. Minas Tirith. It's only a model. Shh. It's the tree. Gandalf. Gandalf. Yes. Okay, hold the phone. What is with those bloody helmets? If I was there, I'd feel obliged to wipe the soles of my dirty shoes on them. Bloody Noras. I mean, what sort of stupid nation has royal guards wearing stupid headwear? Lord Denethor is borrowing his father. To give him news of his beloved son's death would be most unwise. I do not mention Frodo. In fact, it's better if you don't speak at all, Pepkin too. Well, why don't you just tell me we're outside? Well, to be fair, Pippin is an idiot. Knowing him will either fall off the edge of Minas Tirith or anoint the old sapling over there, the yellow tree of Gondor. Hey, at least it'll get a drink. So Gandalf and Pippin meet up with Denethor, who's uh, not exactly in a good mood. Do you think the eyes of the White Tatar are blind? I have seen more than you know. Okay, what is it with the wobble in this guy's face? And with your right, you'd seek to supplant me. Damn. So Denethor's all like, 
Rule of Gondor's mine! Now, where's my bottle? And Gandalf's like, fuck this shit. I've ridden three days to get here. I'm gonna get me a room and just get high. <coughs> you know, I'm beginning to wonder if Gandalf ever really was a great wizard. Perhaps he was always a white wizard, but smoked so much he became grey over time. Sauron has yet to reveal his deadliest servant. The one who will lead Mordor's armies in war. The one they say no living man can kill. The Witch King of Angmar. But in the land of Mordor, he's known by another name. Phil. Of the Nazgul, the greatest of the nine. The dead city. Bradford? Very nasty place. Uh, hey, uh, give that statue a phone there for a second there, will you? Hello? What's up? What's up? <laughs> ah, that reference isn't dead at all. Look, we have found it. The way into Mordor. The secret stair. 2,880 steps, Detective. Do me a favor, keep that kind of shit to yourself. But before they can start their ascent, orcs begin marching out of Kirith Ungol as the building uh, pulls a he-Man on us. Okay, admittedly that light show looks cool, but what's the purpose of it? In fact, if the building didn't have this light show, then Gandalf wouldn't have known that the Orcs were planning on attacking so soon, and he might not have ordered Pippin to light the beacon to ask for Rohan's help yet. Then they'd be fucked as Rohan wouldn't have arrived in time. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about this too hard, I hum. No, 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 no. Well, yes. Well, yes. So Frodo, Sam, and Gollum begin their ascent as we cut to us Gilead as the orcs are about to begin their attack. Quiet. Um, excuse me, Mr. Orc, but if you want to be low key here, it might be a good idea to, uh, oh, I don't know, put out your torches! Right. So the men spot the orcs crap ambush plan, but it's no use as they attack us Gilead in droves. So to help out, Gandalf orders Pippin to light a beacon in Minas Tirith, which sends a signal to several men waiting on standby to light their own beacons in a sort of domino effect, so Rohan will know to ride a war. I should talk about how incredibly implausible it is for men to camp out on top of mountains so they can light a beacon in the unlikely event Gondor requires Rohan's aid, but the music is awesome, the shots are awesome, so in the end, who gives a shit? Well, Aragorn is the first to spot the beacon as he rushes across Edoras to tell Theoden. By God, does Aragorn know how to enter a room? Knuckles for eight! And Rohan will answer. And our answer is no. Fuck him. Hmm. Why do you call me Thrandir when he's happy? Gandalf the Gay. Oh, gambling, this is tripe. Alright, okay, they were here and assembled, but Gimli's not impressed. Horseman! <laughs> I wish I could muster a legion of dwarves, fully armed and filthy. <laughs> okay, I would pay big money to see some of that filthy dwarf action. <laughs> Allow me to rephrase that. So the Rahirim set out, but over the night as Gilead has been overrun, as the Nazgul hunt down the survivors. But Gandalf rides out, with Pippin for some reason, as he has a plan to drag Jerry and his pals away. He shines a light at them. Huh. Well, it's a good thing the Lord of the Rings doesn't take place in a more modern setting. Yo, Jerry! Ah! Get off 
me! Get off me! They don't seem so intimidating when they have the same weakness of a gremlin, do they? So the group reached Midas Tirith, and uh, here's the reason why Pippin was with Gandalf. It's so they could start this conversation. This is not the first halfling to have crossed your path. You've seen Frodo and Sam? Where? When? In Athelion. Not two days ago. Gandalf, they're taking the road to the Mobile Vale. And then the pass of Kiri's uncle. What does that mean? What's wrong? Good God! So, you mean two little hobbits that are travelling into uncharted enemy territory, which houses tens of thousands of orcs, unkillable wraiths, giant spiders, and God knows what else, might be in danger? Well, let's just ignore Gandalf's confusing out of the blue concern, and let's just see how our favourite hobbit troop are getting along, as Sam is growing more and more untrusting of Smeagol. Why does he hate poor Smeagol? What has Smeagol ever done to him? Send forth all legions. Do not stop the attack until the city is taken. Slay them all. Also, if by chance you find any medicine for a sore throat, do us a solid and scrounge up a couple of balls, me, would ya? What of the wizard? I will break him. In the extended edition. And now we're back to two and a half hobbits on ABC. What are you up to? Sneaking off, are we? Sneaking? Sneaking? That is all so polite. Smeagol shows them secret ways that nobody else can find. And they so sneak! Sneak? Yes, my precious boy. Right, right. It startled me as all. What were you doing? Snow. <laughs> oh. Two and a half hours. We'll be right back after these messages. So the group notices that the Lembas bread is gone as Gollum frames Sam for taking it and Sam for some reason chooses this rather inopportune moment to offer to carry the ring. I could help a bit. I could carry it for a while. Carry it for a while. Carry it for a while. I could carry it. I could carry it. Share the load. Share the load. The load. Okay, what's with the weird slow mo close up there? All Sam wants is for Frodo to share his load. What? 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 What to say? No, 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 seriously, Frodo is under a lot of stress. Sam only wants a bit of his lore to help out. Oh, that is All you guys are confusing the hell out of me. Let's just continue. So Frodo decides to send Sam home as we cut back to Faramir, who has apparently been commanded by Denethor to attend to retake us Gilead. And, like a complete idiot, he obeys his commands and ends up getting himself and hundreds of his men needlessly killed. And as his only remaining son is off on a date with death, Denethor asks Pippin a amusing bit with a song. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that Pippin is now a Citadel Guard, because in this world, if you want a job working for the leader of a nation, all you have to do is ask. By God, if it was only that simple. But we have no songs for great halls and evil times. Eh, just give him a rendition of Wiggle by Jason Derulo. If there's any song out there representative of pure evil, it's that one. Come, sing me a song. Okay, am I the only one who's reminded of another movie scene here? It's a small world after all. No, no, anything but that. 
So as Denethor continues acting like a right cock, we see Theoden has mustered up 6,000 spears to aid Gondor, as they've camped at a rather cool looking but quite impractical cliffside. The horses are restless, and the men are quiet. They grow nervous in the shadow of the mountain. That's why we chose to camp right next to its entrance. What kind of assholes like that? But the night falls as a mysterious figure pays Aragorn a visit. My Lord Elrond. Um, am I the only one who sees dressing up all hooded and cloaked like that in this world as a really bad idea? Alright, so Elrond is here to share some of his foresighted. Ness. He knows Thaden's riders will be vastly outnumbered, so he lets Aragorn know where he can find more men. There are none. There are those who dwell in the mountain. Uh, okay, uh, where did that sudden gust of wind come from? What, whenever you talk about something truly evil in this world, a sudden gust of wind pops up? Uh... Okay, um, the dead men have done Harrow. Uh, Sauron. Satan. Simon Cowell. You would call upon them to fight. They believe in nothing. They answer to no one. They will answer to the King of Gondor. Anduril, the flame of the West, forged from the shards of Narsil. Whoa. Shut up and take my money! The blade that was broken shall return to Minas Tirith. So Aragorn heads into the mountain as Legolas and Gimli tag along. Which may sound like they're being supportive and selfless, until you remember that this is getting them out of a battle in which if they do not help, they will surely die. Yeah. Well, anyway, they quickly arrive at the door of the mountain as something gets the horses spooked. Break or come back! I left Andrew on the saddle! God, everyone's gonna kill me. But the three persevere and quickly come across the King of the Dead. The way is shut. Now you must die. Legolas, did you just try to kill a dead person? Uh, maybe. Ugh, bloody hell. Yeah, take these scissors and go give Ross Kemp a haircut while you're at it. None but the King of Gondor may command me. <laughs> that line was broken. Uh. It has been remade. <laughs> So Aragorn offers these guys a deal. If they fight for him, he'll hold their oaths to Wazildar fulfilled, and will release them. Yeah, he's offering to end all their pain and suffering, and all they need to do is fight a battle they literally can't lose. And, as unbelievably cushy as this sounds, the king responds by not saying a word, having him and his men disappear, and then, well, this happens. Heads up! So the three quickly escape the tide of skulls, only for the dead king to then say, Yes, we will fight for you. Man, you think this guy was brain dead or something, wait. Well, anyway, back at Minas Tirith, it turns out that Faramir survived the assault on his Gilead, but stupid Denethor remains convinced his son is dead. It's here he finally realises there's an army of orcs attacking his city. So Denethor steps up to the plate as he musters up the most awe-inspiring speech he can come up with. Abandon your post! Please save my allies! Gandalf delivers the appropriate response. Right, it's bonking time. I love losing a bit of bonking. Three, four, five, six, seven, can't remember the rest. Twelve! Prepare for battle! 
So Gandalf rallies the men, but honestly, I don't like their chances. Gondorian soldiers are like the stormtroopers of Middle Earth. They're uh, kind of hopeless. In fact, they're also likely to die. I'm surprised this doesn't happen. So whilst the army of Gondor continues sucking, Frodo and Gollum have reached the tunnel. Oh wait, sorry. The tunnel. As Gollum is quick to abandon his master. It's sticky. What is it? That's what she. Don't you bloody dare, Bender! You heathen. There could be kids watching. Uh, doesn't it at all bother you that what you might say might be considered inappropriate? <laughs> oh wait, you're serious? Let me laugh even harder. <laughs> Alright, well Frodo decides to use the old Light of Elendil thing he got from Gladrail in the first movie to light up the cave, but it unfortunately attracts a local resident. <laughs> Brother, I got this. Aradia XMA! Wrong universe, run! So Frodo manages to escape through the nearest warp pipe as Gollum is quick to catch Frodo unawares. The precious made us do it. Why is that not on a t-shirt? So Frodo tells Gollum he has to destroy the ring for both their sakes. Gollum takes it like you'd expect. Wow, fail. That almost looked like one of those video game cutscenes where someone misses a QTE. Oh shit! So Frodo continues his journey, but without Sam here, well, he wasn't going to get far, was he? <laughs> um, okay, time out for a moment. Um, aren't we forgetting something here? Mithril, as light as a feather, and as hard as dragon scales. <laughs> well, in the books, Frodo got stabbed in the neck, so, uh, yeah, uh, Jackson? You done fucked it up! But before Sheila can tuck into a Kentucky Fried Hobbit, Sam is back and he is pissed. Let him go, you filth. Me amo Samwise Gamji, tengo grande cojones vos carron. Sauron ain't got shit on me. Samwise is in the house, pulled up. So Sam drives Shelob away as he goes to check on Frodo. And as badass as Sam is, it's a shame he's a bit, um, stupid. Mr. Frodo! Wake up. You know, Sam, there's a little something you can do here. Take these two fingers and check for a pulse. Dad. But a bunch of orcs come by as Sam continues his streak of idiocy as he fucking leaves Frodo out in the open for them to take. Samwise, you fool. No, more like Samwise, you idiot! So yeah, back in Minas Tirith, the battle has moved to the gate as Gandalf rallies the men. Your soldiers of Gondor, no matter what comes through that gate, you will stand your ground. Oh, cock. <laughs> So yeah, the battle ain't going too swimmingly, and to make matters worse, Denethor is heading to the catacombs to burn Faramir alive. Pippin manages to find Gandalf to warn him as they both quickly head up the city, but the two have one tiny little obstacle to overcome as the Witch King shows up and... Holy sh shit, that, that was unexpected.
you was right there, you had him! Oh, why did you immediately fly away like that? As if you just realised there's a new episode of Game of Thrones on. Uh, uh, why were you more like... The world of men will fall. Uh, huh? Oh, wrong answer. Well, I like his birth where he said because she lived to kill the strongest bee in the opposing side. Ah, surely. <laughs> cool, right. Oh, I better kill the hob and the horse too. <laughs> right, off we go. I'm also... And you know what makes that scene worse? Check out what Mary said earlier. The enemy thinks you have the ring. Yeah, the ring race will be under the impression that Pippin has the ring. And the leader of the ring race finds him, and he leaves him be. I mean, yeah, Pippin really doesn't have the ring, but the Witch King don't know that. Ugh, right, well, I guess I shouldn't be too annoyed. This is one of the extended scenes after all, so uh, let's just put it by the wayside, give it the finger, and move on. To a much cooler scene where Rohan arrives on Pelennor Fields, as Theoden rallies his men in an awesome yet rather peculiar fashion. Here it comes, here it comes, this is going to be awesome! Ah, crap. So they're a hero in charge and, oh man, let's just take a moment to enjoy this kick-ass scene. Oh bugger. <laughs> So the Rohirrim begin annihilating the Orcs as Gandalf arrives to kick some flabby steward ass. <laughs> I just love the look on Denethor's face here. Fuck me! No! <laughs> oh, come on, man. This is like one of those things you'd see on like a You Being Frame style show. Our $50,000 home video finalists are... Man breaking hip. <laughs> Man on fire. <laughs> ah, ah, <laughs> look at him. It's okay. Finally, I can live out my dream of becoming the human torch. Boy, my oh shit! So the battle continues below us. There are here in my lane, waste of the ox, but reinforcements are quick to show up. No, the dawn patrol again. Company! Shut up! Oh, the aim of our patrol is a question rather droll. For to march and drill over field and hill. Is a military goal. Is a military goal. So the Rahirim and the rumor kill duke it out, but before long the Bitch King shows up and crushes poor old Thaedon under his horse. So Eowyn, who for some reason finds herself all alone when it comes to defending her king, takes a stab. I'm a woodpecker! Whoa! Damn, why does he have such a big ass mace? Do you think maybe he's compensating for something? <laughs> but Eowyn can't manage such a large instrument. That's what she said! As the Witch King moves in for the kill. You fool. No man can kill me. Except maybe Will I am. His music makes me want to kill myself. Die. No. Hmm, Mishir is taking his sweet ass time here. It's not as if there's an army all around you that could stab you back anytime they please or anything. <laughs> yeah, like that. So Eowyn proudly shouts out, I am no man. Which in hindsight may be more empowering if a male character hadn't just saved her, but whatever. It's around this time our favourite two and a half men show up. Jeez, you know, that was a big leap when you think about it. I mean, look at Gimli, he really struggled with that jump. He's all like... Oh, fuck! I think I just broke my clock six! 
Hell, I'm surprised this didn't happen. So it's go go orc busters as the ghost army just annihilate all in their path. And yet, even with a force this unstoppable, Legolas still finds time to show off. And you gotta love him for it. Triple motherfucking arrow, bitch! Oh yeah, Legolas catch. Oh, bitch, get out the way, get out the way, bitch, get out the way. So the fight is eventually won as Theoden, well, he, he's he's not doing too good. Every bone, shattered organs, leaking vital fluids, a slight headache, loss of appetite. I'm going to die. So Theoden sadly dies on our stand from Space Jam as Aragorn has a promise to uphold. <laughs> Look at the king's face. He's like he's letting out a thousand year old fart. <laughs> I apologise over the multitude of fart jokes in my reviews. Uh, the, the films gift wrapped them for me. Well, let's check back with Frodo, see how he's doing. As it turns out, he's been brought into the Tower of Kirith Ungol. Uh, hands off! That shiny shirt, that's mine! Let's go into the great eye! Uh, but it would look fabulous on me! I don't take orders from stinking Morgul rats! No! So these two end up fighting over the shirt as this is all that's needed to start an all-out civil war. The scum tried to knife me! Kill it! There are some orcs on one side, orcs on the other. Let's get ready to rumble! I got five to one on the orcs, three to one on the orcs. Who must make things interesting? Oh yes, yes, twenty on the orcs, thank you very much sir. Oh yes, ten on the orcs, thank you very, very much sir. You will go home a happy man. Oh yes, sir, twenty on the orcs, if you don't mind me saying you are very, very helpful. So in all the commotion, Sam makes his way up to Frodo. But the orc from earlier is about to kill him. I'm gonna bleed you like a stuck pig. <laughs> Not if I stick you first. I would have also accepted. Looks like you ended up on the short side of the stick. Well, I'm dead. So it turns out Sam actually took the ring to keep it safe. Weird, I didn't see any tearing of the cobweb from earlier. Huh, maybe he did take it from him earlier. Trixie, son of a bitch! You must understand. The ring is my bird. It will destroy you, Sam. Okay, I never got this. Doesn't it make a hundred times more sense for Sam to carry the ring the rest of the way? Sure, it's Frodo's burden. But the ring wouldn't have had nearly as much time to corrupt Sam as it has Frodo. So just get good old Samwise to carry it. What are you on about anyway? The ring will destroy him. He carried it all the way back to you, didn't he? Not to mention Sam is all around more capable, stronger, a better warrior. Like, you know how many orcs Sam has killed over these three films? A lot. And you, Frodo? And you, Frodo? Uh, future me in editing? Hmm? This is where you play Frodo's compilation of orc kills? Uh, sorry, can't do that. What? Why? Frodo's never killed an orc. What? Yeah, seriously, not one orc kill. Not even in the extended editions. I always see him doing action scenes as run and hide all the time. Sheesh, and I thought it was bad when Harry Potter never cast a spell in his first movie. Well, anyway, how's that editing coming along? Eh, alright. Though this is my 87th cup of coffee. Fuck me! No, no, no. You mean, fuck us. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh... Uh, fuck us. Okay, so Frodo and Sam recuperate, and shortly after, they finally reach Mordor. It's him. The Eye. Sam, am I the only one who thinks it looks like a giant flame? No, Mr. Frodo. You're not. Well, back in Minas Tirith, Gandalf and Aragorn are discussing their next course of action. 
Frodo and Sam won't be able to get to Mount Doom with all the orcs and the plains of Gorgoth, so Aragorn has a plan to gather what warriors he can and march upon the Black Gate to draw them all out. A diversion. Yes, Legolas. A diversion. But Aragorn's army quickly reached the gates as a friendly face is there to greet them. My master, Sauron the Great, bids thee welcome. You know, gingivitis is the number one cause of all tooth decay. Oh. And who is this? Okay, so we have here a scene where a king is talking with a messenger of the enemy, who he then brashly kills. Obvious reference is obvious. This is blasphemy. This is madness. Madness. This is Gondor! This uh, concludes negotiations. So the orcs are about to come through. Uh, by the way, I love Legolas' face here. He's like, yeah, bring it, bitch. Well, Aragorn falls back to give his men a rousing speech. Sons of Gondor! Of Rohan! My brothers! I see in your eyes the same fear that would take the heart of me. After all, none of you are now horse-mounted, despite us all leaving Minas Tirith on horses. Disappearing mammals would scare the shit out of anyone. Okay, to be fair, this speech is fucking incredible. An hour of wolves and shattered shields when the age of men comes crashing down. But it is not this day. This day we fight. Whoa. By all that you hold dear on this good earth, I bid you stand, men of the West! For Frodo. And? Hey, 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 are you showing it up against someone? Bloody hell, Sam never gets the recognition he deserves in these movies. If it wasn't for him, Frodo would be dead a thousand times over. Sam's a right ledge. Frodo, on the other hand? There's a few drops left. But uh, look at all the wine he just spilled! No! You killed us all! And uh, what the hell's he doing now? Uh, hallucinating? Hello? Hey! Listen! Hey! Listen! Hey! Listen! <laughs> Alright, so once they reach the mountainside, Frodo is out like a light. So Sam tries to remind him of a better time. Do you remember the Shire, Mr. Frodo? It'll be spring soon. The orchards will be in blossom. And they'll be sowing the summer barley in the lower fields. And Rosie Cotton will be doing her laundry topless and she'll have forgotten to close the window. Hey, I'm only trying to make this scene less gay. Alright, before anyone loses their heads, I gotta make this clear. If Sam and Frodo were actually gay, and if that was intentional, then that'd be great. I wouldn't have anything against that. But they keep having moments like this, embraced in each other's arms, and neither one steps up to bat. Seriously, look at this image and tell me it doesn't look like a scene from Brokeback Mountain Doom. And what makes this worse is how many sexual hints there are between these two. Had eaten the first of the strawberries with cream. Do you remember the taste of strawberries? Oh my god, they're talking about strawberries. If there was ever a food you would associate with sex, that's the bloody one. <laughs> naked in the dark. Now they're talking about being naked. Do I need to keep going? Naked? <laughs> So Sam manages to get Frodo all the way to the top, but unfortunately someone's waiting. Well Sam manages to fight Gollum off as he follows Frodo into the mountain. Hmm, I wonder what got Frodo so spooked. Maybe it's the smell. The dog caught the crack of doom for nothing. <laughs> Just simply drop the ring, that'd be too anticlimactic. So Frodo's all like, The ring is mine. <laughs> and Simon's like, You hairy hobbit f 
and then golems are like BAM! You got knocked the fuck out, man! And then he does something which honestly should be accompanied by the following song. Three, two, one! Hang on, Gollum! Ten more seconds and the world record's in the back! So Gollum manages to find and bite off Frodo's finger. Well, I, at least I hope that's his finger. Yeah, it is. As Gollum once again has the ring, and to celebrate, he jumps about a bit. Well, Frodo's not having any of that, as he musters up all his strength to knock Gollum over the cliff. Okay, now he's gonna knock him over the cliff. Okay, now he, you know what, fuck it. So Gollum hits the lava, Sam saves Frodo, the ring is destroyed, Sauron's all like, Say what? And the Tower of Barado comes tumbling down, everyone cheers, and Sauron, much like his last defeat, has one final gift he like to give to everyone. That everyone died. The end. Alright, okay, that doesn't happen. But a lot of excess gas is escaping from the crack of doom. <laughs> So Sam and Frodo quickly run out of the exploding volcano as Gandalf swoops in on the eagles to save him. Gandalf? Gandalf? Wait a minute. White light. Heavenly music. You're here! <gasps> I'm dead! <laughs> so Frodo is reunited with everyone. Aragorn? Gimli, Legolas, okay I guess I forgot Legolas' name, but this is a weird ass scene, don't believe me, play it in slow-mo. Uh, okay I think I'm just going to add this scene to my collection of film scenes gone high. <laughs> Who wants your wacky wacky? Well, after everyone's celebratory buzz, we cut to Aragorn's coronation, and everyone shows up. Gandalf, Eowyn, Faramir, Judge Dredd, look, even Arwen showed up. That's Legolas. Oh, right. Well, okay, she does show up as they diffuse the tension with a good old snog. It's good to be the king. So the four hobbits are renounced for their good deeds as the camera pans out and the film comes to a close. Oh, what a terrific movie. As it was, the fourth age of Middle Earth began. It, it, it's still going. And the fellowship of okay. The well, alright. Um, so uh, Frodo, Sam, Mary, and Pippin all arrive back in the Shire. As they have a somber little can pie to signify a job well done. But Sam has some unfinished business. Jesus Christ, what did Sam do? <laughs> so Sam gets married as we cut to- Oh bloody hell, is this thing still going? How do you go on? How do you go on? Even the film wants to end! Okay, so Frodo gives Bilbo's book to Sam for him to finish off, as the next day we find out that Bilbo has a limited time ticket to Valinor. Uh, any chance of seeing that old ring of mine again? I'm sorry, Bilbo. You're just not supple enough anymore. Oh, you mean the one ring? Oh, sorry. So the group arrives at the Grey Havens as Gandalf says his goodbye, but Frodo reveals his plans to go too as he says farewell to Merry Pippin and Sam. And it's so sad. We set out to save the show. And it has been saved. But not for me. You don't mean that. Watch this, Lise. You can actually pinpoint the second when his heart rips in half. 
And now. So Frodo says his farewell as the ship sets sail for Valinor, enough tears were shed to irrigate all of Mordor, and our movie comes to a close. Ah, that was a nice win. Oh Jesus H. Christ on a stick, you're still going. <laughs> okay, I'm wrapping this up. Sam arrives home, he meets his wife and kids, they go into their house, which I've just realised how poorly designed it is because even a fucking hobbit has to duck into it. The music builds up, the door closes, the screen fades to black, and... Is, is that it? You're not going to show Sam doing his laundry or anything? It's the end! Now if you excuse me, I need to rearrange my back. Wow! What a movie! Ugh. So that was The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, and uh, to summarise my thoughts on the film, I'll say this. Um, Return of the King is where Lord of the Rings is at its best, but it's also where it's at its worst. Some of the greatest scenes and moments in the trilogy I found here. The Charge of the Rahum, Aragorn's Blackgate speech, Sam vs. Shelob, Pippin singing Edge of Night, the Moomba Kill attack, Sam being a motherfucking legend, I mean the list goes on. But there are a few aspects of this film that can piss off a lot of people and I can definitely see why. Starting with the obvious one, the never ending... Um, ending. The ring is destroyed, Middle Earth is saved, and all these fades to black and pan out shots really make you think the movie's coming to a close. But it doesn't. Again. And again. And again. And when you were back in the cinema in 2003, I'm willing to bet you heard a few Ugh, every time the movie continued. But I'm actually going to be one to defend the ending here, because as I essentially said at the end of my Deathly Hallows Part 2 review, epilogues are important. Like the first time you think the movie's ending in Return of the King is when Sam and Frodo are trapped on the edge of Mount Doom. But if the movie did end here, I'd be pissed. The movie's all about the three peoples defeating Sauron and saving Middle Earth, and we needed to see what they were fighting for. Again, it's why I hate the ending of Death of Kalos Part 2 so much, because once Voldemort is defeated, we skip to 19 years later after only 4 minutes of screen time. We got no closure of where the characters ended up, we didn't even see a single scene of the Wizarding World rejoicing over the Dark Lord's demise. The only important thing that happened in those 4 minutes was... <clears throat> in Return of the King, however, we get some much needed closure. Aragorn has his coronation, Frodo and Gandalf are reunited, Sam gets married. Part of me wishes I could see more. Like we could perhaps see Aemir ascend the throne of Rohan, we could see a quick shot of Aragorn and Arwen with their newborn son, we could see Legolas and Gimli set off for the Grey Havens like they did in the book. But yeah, I do understand why people were a little cheesed off with the fake out endings. The movie is over three hours long after all. Four hours if you include the extended scenes. After that, your butt's going to be numb, your bladder's going to be bursting, and you're honestly going to have to readjust yourself as you relearn the art of standing. But I honestly think the Lord of the Rings films are of only a handful of movies that deserve to be over three hours long. Why? Well, simply put, so much shit goes down in them. There's such a mishmash of genres, action, drama, romance, horror, comedy, adventure. There's never a dull moment, and if you're bored by these movies, then I'm willing to bet a lot of movies bore you. Because I never thought I'd say this about a movie, but I like the 4 hour version of this movie more than the 3 hour one. A lot of crucial, no, mandatory scenes were cut for the theatrical release. I am utterly perplexed why the Saruman scene was cut. Go watch Nostalgia Critic's Top 11 Dumbest Lord of the Rings Moments video if you want to know what I think about that. Another important scene is the one with the mouth of Sauron, because in the theatrical version of the film, they just go to the Black Gate, and they're like, oh, Why is no one coming? Okay, let's go to the gate. Hey, anybody home? Alright, there is someone home. Okay, go back now. See, without the mouth of Sauron, that scene is just pointless. Though I will say that there were some scenes that were rightly cut, like Gandalf's encounter with the Witch King. The way he just flies off when he's about to deliver the killing blow is beyond stupid. Then there's the scene where Aragorn uses the Palantir to taunt Sauron. Never got why he did that, it just seemed way out of character. Also, cutting this scene does lead to a much better segue to the next scene. You see, here's the extended cut. Certainty of death, small chance of success. What are we waiting for? Sauron will suspect a trap. 
And here's the theatrical one. Certainty of death, small chance of success. What are we waiting for? That's a much better edit, I think. Now something else I want to bring up concerns Eowyn and Arwen, because it's clear these two were underutilizing two towers. And whilst Arwen still mostly mopes and cries all the time, Eowyn gets to kick some serious ass. But maybe a bit too much ass. I wanted to see Eowyn in some cool action scenes no doubt, but she freaking takes down a Mooma kill and a fell beast single-handedly. And with the help of Merry was able to defeat the bloody Witch King, someone even Gandalf couldn't defeat. Eowyn essentially became the most powerful warrior in all of Middle-earth. It was a little hard to buy, and not because she was a woman, it was because we had never seen her in an action scene before. Literally all we got was her swinging a sword a bit. Ooh, that must mean she's the greatest warrior in the land. Hell, we don't even know if Eowyn has ever killed an orc prior to this movie. I mean, check out what Eomer says here. You know as little of war as that hobbit. Yeah. I'm betting prior to this she hasn't been in a single battle. What we needed with Eowyn was just at least one scene which shows that this woman is capable of feats like this. But and beyond nitpicking here. Return of the King is awesome and I say it rightfully deserves its 11 Oscars. Granted if Return of the King came out in a more competitive year, I doubt it would have won as many but still, it was deserving. I remember eagerly anticipating this movie for the majority of 2003, and when I sat down to watch it in the theatre, well, I don't think I've ever been more glued to my seat. The action delivered, the effects, sets and prosthetics were all amazing, the comedy was a lot of fun, the music, by god Howard Shaw is on fire here, not to mention Annie Lennox's Into the West, which I just adore. What can Anyway, to see this trilogy come to a close was very fulfilling and yet a little saddening as I knew it was over. And yes, the Hobbit trilogy has helped satisfy my Middle Earth craving, but I think it's universally thought that those films don't come close to capturing the magic of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Now as far as my favourite of the three films go, it's really tough to say, but I'm going to have to go with Two Towers as my personal favourite, as this is where characters like Legolas, Gimli and Gollum get to truly shine. But that is not to discredit Return of the King one bit because it rounds up the franchise phenomenally well to give us quite possibly the greatest movie trilogy of all time. Now to review a trilogy of films that uh, are quite so revered. Till next time. Oh, bugger.